Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck Part 21. I still see it as something more than a coincidence that the U-556 was the boat ordered to pick up Bismarck's war diary because to us on board U-556 was no ordinary U-boat. There was a very special bond between the little boat and the giant battleship. Both were built at Blumen Foss and in the summer of 1940 they were often neighbors on the slipways. When U-556 was commissioned, the mighty bow of the Bismarck towered over her. Wolfhard, who was known in naval circles as Sir Parsifal, decided that the commissioning ceremony would not be complete without a marching band and, since a U-boat certainly did not carry one, he would ask the big neighbor, which as fleet flagship had a band, called the Fleet Band, to provide the music. Accordingly, he went to see Lindemann and he did not go empty-handed. In exchange, he offered the Bismarck the Patenschaft of his boat. Lindemann readily accepted. Wolfhard got his band and thereafter his artistically designed Patenschaftsurkunde hung aboard Bismarck. Lindemann and Wolfhard became friends. At the beginning of 1941, Bismarck and U-556 were together during gunnery exercises in the Baltic and once even used the same target. U-556, which Lindemann had allowed to precede him, damaged the target so badly with 10 hits that Bismarck could not use it that day. Lindemann, however, did not take it amiss and soon dispelled Wolfhard's fear that he would be greeted with an ill-humored reaction. I do not begrudge you that in the least. I wish that you may have as much and rapid success in the Atlantic and win the Knight's Cross for it. Relieved, Wolfhard replied, I hope we both receive the Knight's Cross in the common struggle in the Atlantic. Wolfhard heard over the radio about the sinking of the hood during the operation he had just ended against convoys. At first, he could not believe it. Now, only two days later, the situation of Bismarck was drastically different, almost hopeless in fact. What did his Patenschaftsurkunde say again? We, U-556 of 500 tons, hereby declare before Neptune, the ruler of the oceans, lakes, seas, rivers, brooks, ponds and rills, that we will stand beside our big brother, the battleship Bismarck of 42,000 tons, whatever may befall her on water, land or in the air. Hamburg, 28th of January 1941, signed captain and crew of U-556. One of the two sketches of the certificate shows Sir Parsifal warding off aircraft attacking the Bismarck with a sword in his right hand and stopping torpedoes coming towards her with his left thumb. The other sketch shows Bismarck being towed by U-556. It almost seemed as though Wolfhard had the gift of prophecy when he prepared that certificate. Help against aircraft and torpedoes and then a tow. That was exactly what Bismarck needed and he, of all people, Godfather Wolfhard, was near her. But he was completely powerless to help. The clock was crawling towards 0800. It had been bright daylight for a long time. I could not understand why there was still nothing to be seen of the enemy's battleships. Hadn't they had time to catch up with us during the night? Where were they? At the moment, there was no specific order from the ship's command that I had to carry out and nothing important demanded my presence in the aft fire control station. So I decided to roam around a little and started with the wardroom. As I went in for the first time, I became strongly aware that we were listening to port. It was strange how much more pronounced the effect was in this closed room than elsewhere. A handful of officers, the senior of whom was Corvettenkapitän Wilhelm Freitag, was sitting round the table. The names of the others escaped me. On the opposite side of the room was a large terrine, its dippers hanging in a sweet gruel that sloshed back and forth with the rolling of the ship. The silence at the table was broken from time to time by a laconic, hopeless remark. How could it have been otherwise? After all, we were by ourselves. Why continue to play games? We all knew what was to come. Finally, someone said, Today, my wife will become a widow, but she doesn't know it yet. It was quite depressing. Too depressing, in fact, to stay there. Next, I went to the bridge, which struck me as pretty deserted. That was an illusion, because there were men stretched out in the corners. Lindemann himself was standing in the forward conning tower. His steward, Arthur Meyer, was just handing him his breakfast and, while he ate it, he seemed strangely detached from his surroundings. He saw me coming, but he did not return my salute, which I held as I looked at him intently in the hope that he would say something. He did not say a word. He did not even glance at me. 
I was greatly disturbed and puzzled. After all, I had been his personal adjutant and the situation we were in seemed to me unusual enough to merit some remark. I would have given a great deal for a word from him, one that would have told me how he felt about what had happened. But there was only silence and I had to try to interpret it for myself. That was not the Lindemann we all knew. I thought back. In private conversations in the past year, he told me how much he had always wanted to have command of a great battleship and how happy he was to be appointed commanding officer of Bismarck. He did say, however, that command of a flagship was not exactly what he had hoped for. Having an admiral embarked could, at critical moments, lead to differences that did not arise in a so-called brown ship. In the Kriegsmarine, a brown ship was one in which no force commander, usually from the rank of Konteradmiral upwards, was embarked and consequently the captain was the highest ranking officer on board. Naturally, the personalities involved would have a lot to do with that. Early in 1941, a classmate asked him, how goes it with Lütjens? His terse reply was, not easy. His only consolation, Lindemann also told me, was that if his ship, the flagship of the fleet commander, were ever to be put in unnecessary danger, the blame would be on the admiral and not on him. These words came back to me, loud and clear, as I watched him standing there. Was that the way he felt about what had happened? Was his demeanor intended to show that he accepted none of the responsibility for the situation into which his ship had been led? When command decisions were called for in the course of Exercise Rhine, wouldn't at least some of those he made have been different from those made by Lütjens and wouldn't he have chosen differently from among the alternatives available? After the intelligence service center's report about the alerting of the enemy on May the 21st, for example, or when the Suffolk and the Norfolk were first sighted? And what decision would he have made on the question of continuing the action against the Prince of Wales on the morning of May the 24th? Mustn't my yearning to know his thoughts have been apparent to him? Wouldn't it unlock his lips? Wouldn't he say, Mülheim, if you live through this, tell them in Berlin how I would have conducted this operation. Then his words would have come, terse and precise, would have engraved themselves in my brain until the day I reported to Berlin. So many woulds and ifs. If just one question had been decided differently early in the game, the subsequent course of the operation could have been different in so many ways. There would have been no guarantee against defeats and losses, but Bismarck might not have suffered such a lingering death. The personalities of the two officers certainly played a role in what took place. Lütjens was deeply impressed with what he took to be the superiority of British radar and his mood varied between optimism and despondency. Lindemann judged matters more realistically and resisted the depression of the fleet commander until finally, in military submission, he capitulated. Junak's impression of Lindemann was much like mine. Towards morning, he later said, All I had full. Orders to the engines gradually stopped coming and the atmosphere in the ship became somewhat calmer. Lehmann called him to the engine control station to take over the watch for a little while. Just then the order came from the bridge, All engines stop. When some time passed and no other order came, Junak began to fear that, after the strains of the past hours, the turbines might be warped by heat expansion. He therefore picked up the telephone and asked for the captain. Having reported his concern to Lindemann, he requested an order for All Ahead Slow and was greeted with the reply, Ach, do as you like. That was not the Lindemann Junak knew. Only four hours earlier, Lindemann was a completely different person. Around 0400 he was standing silently beside Schneider in a corner of the bridge. Then he moved away, but a moment later returned, beaming with delight, and went over to Schneider. A radio signal announcing that Schneider had been awarded the Knight's Cross had just arrived and Lindemann offered congratulations to his first gunnery officer. Cool and collected as ever, nothing about him betrayed his awesome worries. But when I saw him at about 8 o'clock, he had been on the bridge of his helpless ship for 11 hours straight. The rudder hit, the destroyer attacks, it was all too much. Was this really, as it was to all appearances, the way Lindemann felt? In these tragic moments, was he inwardly preoccupied, too preoccupied to break his silence with reviewing his life and the fate by which his boyhood dream of commanding a ship had been fulfilled for only nine action-packed days, nine short days, which had been overshadowed by depressing differences with his superior? The answer to that question was lost when he died two hours later. Before I left to continue my tour of the ship, I threw a last glance at Lindemann and at Meyer, who was still standing in front of him the good Arthur Meyer, who managed a pub in Hannover. 
When I was serving as Lindemann's adjutant, I saw him every day as he looked after the needs of his captain and brought him his three castle cigarettes. Arthur Meyer was always ready for a little chat. He could imagine much nicer things than war and being in the navy, but, as he said resignedly, one had to serve somewhere and being aboard Bismarck was quite all right with him. Such a big ship and such heavy armor, it would be hard for anything to happen to him there. How often he said that, and now his last dawn had broken. From the bridge I went down the small ladder to the chart house. The atmosphere in there was ghostly. A lamp lit up a lonely chart on which no more course would be plotted. The rest of the room was dark, apparently no one was there. Our position, when we received the rudder hit the previous evening, was marked on the chart. I could see where our course towards Saint-Nazaire ended. From there on, a serpentine line showed our swerving course to the northwest into the wind. Where the line stopped must be where we were at the moment. Navigationally, everything was up to date. Was there really no one in there? Then, in the corner I saw two men stretched out on deck. Well, they had nothing better to do, so I quickly left the room. As I passed the heavy flag guns on my way back to my station, I suddenly saw Lutyens. I had not seen him since Exercise Rhine began on May 19th, and now, in this situation, what would he say to me? For he would surely say something, perhaps in view of our long acquaintance. Well, Müllenheim, now we are going down together too, or something of the sort. Accompanied by his second staff officer, Fregattenkapitän Paul Ascher, he came straight towards me, obviously on his way to the Admiral's Bridge. There was not much room to pass, so I stood aside and saluted. Lütjens looked at me briefly, attentively, and returned my salute. But not a word came from him either. He gave no sign of acknowledgement that we were in an extraordinary predicament, even though we almost brushed together as he passed. Disappointment, indeed astonishment, at so much speechlessness and the certainty that I would never see Lütjens and Usher again made me turn around and look after them as long as I could. Günther Lütjens, fleet commander and my commanding officer in the Karlsruhe during her cruise to North and South America from 1934 to 1935. What memories he brought back. As a Leutnant zur See aboard Karlsruhe, I was the range-finding officer and a divisional section officer. Lütjens attended divisional instruction more often than any other commanding officer I ever served with and paid closer attention. Having been chief of the Office of Naval Personnel in the Defense Ministry from 1931 to 1934, he took special interest in how his junior officers performed in the training of their men and wanted to see for himself. Other images came before me. The tall, slim figure and the dignified bearing of the Karlsruhe's commanding officer when he was representing his country on ceremonial occasions in foreign ports. He was not the kind of superior whom we junior officers would seek out for ourselves. He was too reserved for that. He seemed almost melancholic. Yet we were conscious of the integrity and reliability that he exuded. And now as fleet commander, I had no first-hand knowledge. I had never served directly under him. But we in the officer corps were aware that Räder had a very high degree of confidence in him. And Ascher, one of those affected by Hitler's imbecilic Aryan paragraph, who, in accordance with the exceptions it made, was, as a veteran of the First World War, allowed to remain in the Navy, even though he was Jewish. In December of 1939, he had been first gunnery officer on the pocket battleship Graf Spee and later told his friend Puttkammer of her battles with the British cruisers Ajax, Achilles and Exeter of the River Plate. I never got to do any proper shooting, was how he put it because every time I had just range and attained bearings on one cruiser, another showed up and that meant change target to the other. The rate of fire of my 28cm guns really wasn't that great, so it always took a while to get the new range and bearings. I wasted all my ammunition without real chances. Lütjens and Usher had long since disappeared out of sight. I looked at the clock. It was past 08.30 and still, where were the Britons? They should have been here at daybreak at the latest. I still could not understand their delay. Hardly had I formulated that thought, then the alarm bells began to ring shrilly. It seemed as though they would never stop. Bismarck's last battle was about to begin. The alarm bells were still ringing when, returning from the bridge, I entered my action station. I picked up the control telephone and heard, two battleships, port bow. I turned my director and saw two bulky silhouettes, unmistakably the King George V and Rodney, at a range of approximately 24,000 meters. As imperturbable as though they were on their way to an execution, they were coming directly towards us in line abreast, a good way apart, their course straight as a die. The seconds ticked by, 
Tension and anticipation mounted, but the effect was not what Tavi hoped for. The nerves of our gun directors, gun captains and rangefinding personnel were steady. After the utterly hopeless night they had just spent, any action could only be a release. The very first salvo would bring it. How many ships were approaching no longer meant anything, as we could be shot to pieces only once. Our eight 38cm guns were now opposed to nine 40.6cm and ten 35.6cm guns, our 12 15cm guns by 28 15.2cm and 13.3cm guns. A single British broadside weighed 18,448 kg against 6,904 kg for a German broadside. In our foretop, Schneider was giving orders in his usual calm voice. He announced that our target was the Rodney, which was off our port bow and heading straight for us. Then, to the ship's command, Main and secondary batteries ready. Request permission to fire. But it was the Rodney that got off the first salvo at 0847. King George V's first salvo followed one minute later. The range had closed to less than 20,000 meters, at which distance the time of flight of the shells was less than one minute, but it seemed many times that long. Finally, white mushrooms, tons of water thrown up by heavy shells, rose 70 meters into the air. But they were still quite far from us. At 0849, Bismarck's four turrets replied with a partial salvo at Rodney. At this time, our aft turrets could not be brought to bear on the target. Schneider observed his first three salvos as successively short, straddling and over. An extremely promising start that I only knew about from what I heard on the telephone because the swinging back and forth of Bismarck allowed me only intermittent glimpses of the enemy. Obviously not considering dividing our fire, he continued to concentrate on Rodney. As the shells hurtled past one another in the air, I tried to distinguish incoming ones from those being discharged from our own guns. Suddenly I remembered wardroom conversations that I had had with British naval officers regarding range-finding techniques. They had high praise for their prismatic instruments, while I praised our stereoscopic ones. Did we have the better principle? The Rodney seemed to need a lot of time to find our range. I spent the first few minutes of the battle wondering why no enemy shells were landing on us. But that soon changed and there were more than enough of them. At 0854 the Northwark, which was off the Bismarck starboard bow, began firing her 20.3cm battery at a range of 20,000 meters forward of the starboard quarter. A few minutes later, Rodney opened up with her secondary battery and, around 0902, she observed a spectacular hit on the forward part of Bismarck. At 0904 the Dorsetshire began firing on us at a range of 18,000 meters from the starboard side astern. Bismarck was under fire from all directions and the British were having what amounted to undisturbed target practice. Not long after the action began, the King George V and a little later Rodney gradually turned to starboard onto a southerly course where they maneuvered so as to stay on our port side. This tactic caused the range to diminish with extraordinary rapidity, which seemed to be exactly what Tavi wanted. Lindemann could no longer maneuver so as to direct or at least influence the tactical course of the battle. He could neither choose his course nor evade the enemy's fire. Tavi, on the other hand, could base his tactical decisions on the sure knowledge that our course would continue to be into the wind. We could not steer even this course to the best advantage of our gunners, who were faced with great difficulty in correcting direction. Though I could not see what was going on around me from my completely enclosed armored control station, it was not hard to picture how the scene outside was changing. As the range decreased, the more frequent became the rumphs of incoming shells and the louder grew the noise of battle. Our secondary battery, as well as those of the enemy, had gone into action. Only our anti-aircraft guns, which had no targets of their own and were useless in a close engagement between battleships, were silent. At first, their crews were held as replacements for casualties at other guns and were stationed in protected rooms set aside for them. These protected rooms, however, being on the main deck and not heavily armored, provided little protection even against shell splinters, let alone direct hits at the ranges this battle was fought. When perhaps 20 minutes had passed since the firing of the first salvos, I searched the horizon through my starboard director for other hostile ships. Off our starboard bow, I made out a cruiser, the Norfolk, which by chance had just stopped firing. We had not fired on her because Schneider and Albrecht were still concentrating on the battleships which were off our port bow and at that moment not visible from aft. 
No sooner had I begun to wonder whether, with so many enemies around us, our ship's command would decide to divide our fire, than I received an indirect answer. Cardinal came on the control telephone and said that the main fire control station, the foretop, was out of action or, at any rate, could not be contacted, that Torrets Anton and Bruno were out of action and that I was to take over control of Torrets Cesar and Dora from aft. He said nothing about the forward fire control station. I suppose that it would continue to direct the secondary battery, unless it had been disabled, which seemed not unlikely in view of the number of times the forward section of the ship had been hit. There was no time to ask long questions and, since I was not given a target, I had completely free hand. An observer in the Norfolk saw both barrels of Torrid Anton fall to maximum depression as though its elevating mechanism had been hit. The barrels of Torrid Bruno, he commented, were trained to port and pointing high into the air. Action circuit aft, which meant that the turrets were being directed by the aft fire control station, I announced and, beginning forward, scanned the horizon through my port director. Strangely enough, there was no trace of the Rodney, which I had not seen to starboard, either. She must have been in the dead space forward of my station. But there, steaming on a reciprocal course and now a bit abaft our beam, was the King George V. She was about 11,000 meters distant, near enough to touch, almost like a drill in the Baltic. Passing fight to port. Target is battleship at 250 degrees. I told the aft computer room and, upon receiving the ready report from below, one salvo, boom! It went off and during the approximately 20 seconds that it was in the air I added, battleship bow left one point off, enemy speed two zero knots. The excellent visibility would be a great help in finding range quickly, I thought, which was particularly important because the target was rapidly passing astern of us. Attention, impacts, announced the computer room. Two questionably right, two right wide, questionably over, I observed, then ordered. Ten more left, down four, one salvo, boom. Attention, impacts. Middle, over, down four, one salvo. Attention, impacts. Middle, short. And, full of anticipation, up to, good, rapid. Then again our shot fell and the four columns of water began to rise quarter, half, three quarters of the way, at which point they were useful for observation. Three over, one short. I never did see the splashes reach their full height. Lieutenant Commander Hugh Guernsey in the King George V heard my fourth salvo whistle over and, wondering if the next one would be a hit, involuntarily took a step back behind a splinter shield. My aft director gave a violent shudder and my two petty officers and I had our heads bounced hard against the eyepieces. What was that? When I tried to get my target in view again, it wasn't there. All I could see was blue. I was looking at something one didn't normally see, the blue layer baked on the surface of the lenses and mirrors to make the picture clearer. My director had been shattered. Damn, I had just found the range of my target and now I was out of the battle. Though no one in the station was hurt, our instruments were ruined. Obviously, a heavy shell had passed low over our station and carried away anything that protruded. We tested all our optics and couldn't see our targets through any of them. I walked under the ladder to the cupola and looked up towards our large rangefinder and its operators. There was nothing there, nothing at all. What only a moment before was a complete array had vanished without a trace. A heavy shell had ripped through the middle of the cupola whose jagged ruin allowed a clear view of the cloudy sky. Where did it come from? Rodney? King George V? Who knows? It made no difference. My god, we said to ourselves, that was close. Two meters lower and it could have been the end of us. The armor of our station would not have been enough protection against a direct hit at that range. Nothing could have been more devastating to me than being put out of action just when I had every hope of hitting the King George V. For our ship, that was the end of all central fire command. I called both computer rooms, but neither of them could get through to the forward fire control station. The only thing to do was let Torrid's Cesar and Dora fire independently. My station being blind, I told their commanders that they were free to choose their targets. At 0916, shortly after losing six torpedoes from a distance of about 10,000 meters, all of which missed us, Rodney turned to a northerly course and became the target chosen by our torrid commanders. This choice was made apparently because the range to the Rodney, which did not go as far to the south as King George V, had closed to 7,500 meters. The last shots of our aft turrets were not badly aimed. A few shells fell very near the Rodney. 
At 0927, one of our four turrets, either Anton or Bruno, fired one more salvo, but the firing became irregular and finally petered out. First, Torret Dora and then Caesar fell silent. At 0931, Bismarck's main battery fired its last salvo. The final battle has begun, and we've now heard how the conditions made targeting the British ships quite difficult. It's been a matter of contention for a long time how Bismarck fared so poorly in the final battle, gunnery-wise that is, after being so brilliant against Hood. But we now know that the weather and especially Tavi's tactical acumen made concentrated fire almost impossible. We've also heard how both Lütjens and Lindemann were completely dejected in the face of oblivion. A lot of people in the comments have criticized Lütjens for making the wrong decisions and rightfully so. Our boy Borkart himself is very critical of this man's performance, especially after knowing him better than most men aboard. So, at this point Bismarck's main battery is out of action, central fire control has been destroyed and the situation is deteriorating by the minute. The carnage of the battle will commence in the next episode. I will see you then. Cheers. Bye bye.